A few years ago, my wife and I flew to New York City to spend a few days. And because of how the flight had to be booked, we could not take a plane from here directly to New York. We had to route through Orlando. So we flew from here to Orlando to New York City, and, and my wife w was saying, what happens if your luggage doesn't come? And so we, we landed in New York City. It's probably maybe 10.30 in the evening. I think we took off from here. It uh, would have been Sunday evening sometime after church. And so we're, we're sitting there waiting for the baggage carousel to come around, and oh, there's my luggage. I pull it off. And then we waited, and then we waited, and it became unfortunately clear that it wasn't my clothing and things that got left in Orlando, it was Tiffany's. Now, I want you to understand that it's not a good thing. when a woman's stuff gets left somewhere in the cyber world of luggage in America somewhere. And so we're waiting for this luggage to arrive, and it never did, and then you know you have, it's getting later and later, and then you know you have to file a report, and, but, but she's thinking, I have nothing. Uh, and the most important thing, of course, uh, was not the clothing, but the makeup. <laughs> the hairspray. And, and the accessories that are needful to fix one's eyes and other things. So we finally got the report made, and it's about a... 30 to 45 minute drive. It's not that far on paper, but in New York City, it's about 30 to 45 minutes to, to drive, take a, a taxi from the airport to the hotel. So we knew that when we got into downtown New York City into Manhattan, we were going to have to buy something in order so that Tiffany would be able to survive for the 24 hours that it would take for the luggage to be able to get to our hotel room. So it's now about 1 or 1.30 in the morning, and we're walking around New York City. Uh, and no, I don't want that picture. Put that back. I don't want that yet. <laughs> we're walking around New York City, uh, and it's like it's... 12 o'clock in the afternoon. There are people everywhere. I mean, there's cars, there's thousands of people walking, and, and we're going into H&M uh, to buy things at about 1.30 or 2 o'clock in the morning. Because, as you know, New York City is the city that never sleeps. Okay, That was true. There's people everywhere. And so we purchased, she purchased what she needed, and then we were hungry. Well, you can find food in a lot of places at 2 o'clock in the morning in New York City. And, and New York City has some of the best pizza that you're going to eat. So we said, well, let's get some pizza. And so we found this pizza place, we got it to go, we put it in a pizza box and started walking down the street. She ate hers, I ate part of mine. I said, you know what, I'm going to wait until I get back to the hotel room and it's in a pizza box. So we walked into the hotel. Just keep in mind the activity that is going on at 2 o'clock in the morning in New York City. Uh, you drive through the streets at Newton at 5 o'clock, it's dead. <laughs> It's 2 a.m. in the morning, and the New York City is alive. Okay. So we get on the elevator, and I want you to get the visual with me. You've all ridden on an elevator at least once in your life, right? 
Uh, and so it, it's me, it's Tiffany, and as we get on the elevator, a guy walks into the elevator with us, and the door closes. And we start to go up. I think we were probably on the 40-something floor. So it takes a second to go up there, and we're standing. It, it's Tiffany, me, the guy, and the pizza box. And the guy says to us, Mmm, that smells good. <laughs> Can I have some? <laughs> I'm like, dude, I haven't like eaten. What's the matter with you asking a stranger for the food that is in his pizza box? <laughs> so what did you do? <laughs> I gave him the pizza. <laughs> and went to bed hungry. <laughs> He'd probably been smoking weed or something and was hungry, likely. I, I, I promise you that was, was the case. New York City was the city that never sleeps. Until two years ago, when everything shut down, and this is a picture from 2020, if you've never been to New York City before, those streets are always full of vehicles and people. New York City shut down to silence and to open streets and open roads and closed businesses. No 2 a.m. pizza. And in many cases, no availability of hotels. There's actually biblical precedent for this because there's really nothing new in history that has happened that the Bible doesn't have something to say about, and we can say all of the reasons why there was a worldwide shutdown, and we can go into all of the excuses of, of why that took place, but there's this little scripture that we can just run over in our reading of the Bible and miss a significant point of biblical and current history. It's in Judges chapter 5, and this is what the Bible says. In, in the days of Shamgar, who was one of the judges, son of Anath, in the days of Jael, the highways were abandoned. Now, you have to understand that that little scripture in the context of where the nation of Israel was at in the moment, this is the book of Judges, and Judges is the time frame between the death of Joshua and those that outlived Joshua and the conquering of the land and until before there is a king. It's this intermediate time, and there's a, there's a phrase that is used twice in the book of Judges and then a piece of it is used numerous times. It says, in those days there was no king in Israel. And you, you remember that Israel had asked for a king. They, they would ask for a king later because they had rejected God as their king. This is what the Lord will tell the prophet Samuel later on. They don't want me as king. They want to have an earthly king. And, and God, as God often does, gave them what they wanted, but you're in a time frame here when the Bible says, in those days there was no king, and every man or woman did what was right in their own eyes. Because when you are your own king, you are your own ruler. You can do what you want to do, because you're the king. And so whatever other laws there are, whatever other guidelines there are, whether they're in the Word of God or not, it doesn't really matter because you're in charge. And every man did what was right in their own eyes. And, and you can see this degeneration of culture and society that results in that because the roads were no longer safe to drive on whatever the reasons were, whatever the reasons were in 2020, we can say it was because of a pandemic, 
But it was much, and is much, and was much deeper than that. Every man did what was right in their own eyes, and it affected the culture. And people had to change their going about because they were their own king or queen. They did what they wanted to do because you can. I did it because I can. And nobody has to tell me what to do. And you, and you see this cycle that will occur over and over again in this historical book called The Judges. And it's this sin cycle that begins with sin because every man does what is right in their own eyes. And, and then they come under this thing of suffering. You can read about it. They're, they would sin. And then because of their lifestyle and their sin, they would just come under oppression either by a foreign nation, uh, a financial issue, uh, the economy changing, whatever it was. And it shifted everything of what the memory of the conquering of Joshua over the giants and the taking of the land and God walking with them and they were defeating enemy after enemy after enemy after enemy and suddenly they're not defeating any enemy. The enemies are defeating them. And there's this over and over cycle in the book of Judges of this sin and then suffering. They come under this oppression and then they recognize what they have done. And then they call out to God and say, God, please help us. And that God will bring them salvation. And the, and the entire book of Judges is really about the deliverers. They weren't judges in the sense of a court system, although they did do that. The judges were deliverers or people that God would raise up to rescue Israel. And this cycle would occur. So as soon as they'd have salvation, they would go along good for a while. And then they would fall back into the pattern of sin. And it, it happens over and over again in the book. Sin, suffering, supplication, salvation. Sin, suffering, supplication, and salvation. Over and over and over again. And Yet in the middle of that, God would, would raise up these people that would become the mediator or you could say the intercessor between the people and God. And it's interesting who God would choose to use <laughs> because it wouldn't be the people that you and I would think were qualified. It is my belief that God always uses the unqualified. People that other individuals wouldn't think could do anything. People that other individuals would say, oh, don't, don't go there with them. Even people in their own minds, yeah, I'm just a little old me. God, God is not gonna be able to do much with me, and, and I want you to hear me closely because we're going to take the next three weeks and we're going to prep for 2023. Look at somebody and say, this is a preparation. Because I believe as the calendar turns from December 31st into January 1, 2023 is going to be the year of the unqualified. And God is going to take individuals who felt less than, and God is going to make them more than. God is going to take people who, who looked at other individuals whom they thought had all of the talents and giftings and all that goes along with that, because honestly, if we're honest about it this morning, we do make a lot of comparisons with ourselves and other people. Somebody be honest about it and say amen. I can't pray like that person. I can't talk like that person. I can't sing like that person. I can't lead like that person. I can't have a business like that person. And on and on and on and on. And I really felt the Lord impress upon my heart that 2023 is the year of the unqualified. So stop looking at what you do not have to offer and start looking at what God has to offer. Okay. So 
So let's just take a quick journey on one of these stories. And, and then we're going to pray. And we've got a long way to go and a short time to get there. <laughs> that I, I realize sometimes that the, the, the seat cannot endure what the mind cannot comprehend. So let's see if we don't have to sit too long before we pray. And everybody said, Here, here's, here's, a, here's the characterization of the book of Judges. And I want you to, to grab a hold of this with me because this is, it just jumped out at me. There's a piece of this that jumped out at me. So in Judges chapter number 10, again, everybody say again. This is our tendency. You and I don't have to do anything to lean into ourselves or to lean into our flesh. You've got to do nothing to let that happen. It happens automatically. I'm going to do what is right in my own eyes without help from everybody else. That's just what I tend to do. That's what you and I tend to do. And so it says, again, the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord. They served the Baals and the Ashtoreths and the gods of Aram and the gods of Sidon and the gods of Moab and the gods of the Ammonites and the gods of the Philistines. Pick a god, whatever it is. They did what they wanted to do just like you and I do. And because the Israelites forsook the Lord and they no longer served him, he became angry with them and he sent them and sold them into the hands of the Philistines, the Ammonites. This was God doing this. This wasn't the result of bad political or economic decisions. Their economy wasn't dying and being challenged because somebody in the front seat didn't know what they were doing. This was an act of God. It would be an act of God to bring the people back to him. You have to understand that everything that God does is always redemptive. God's always trying to get us back to himself. And he sold them into the hands of the Philistines and the Ammonites who that year, that year, that year, we read over these things so quickly, that year shattered and crushed them. And watch this, for how many years? Eighteen years they oppressed all of the Israelites, God's people, on the east side of the Jordan in Gilead, the land of the Amorites. This was really supposed to be the land of God, and it ended up being the land of the enemy. It was occupied by the enemy, but it was supposed to be occupied by the people of God. And I thought, how do you describe 18 years? Because it's hard for us. Well, maybe not. It's not hard for us maybe to imagine a struggle that somebody has had for a long time. It's not hard for us to imagine an 18-year-old addiction. It's not hard for us to grasp somebody that's been in an issue over and over again and it doesn't go away. And so it, it happens when they're 15 and 16 years old, then they're 25 and they're still dealing with it, then they're 30 and then they're 35 and then they're 40. And I tell younger kids all the time when they're struggling with something, I say, let's get this dealt with now so you're not a 50-year-old man or woman having the same conversation. Because we've adopted this theology in America that, well, God is just going to help me in my struggle. And he does. I'm telling you, he does. But if the victory of the cross is anything at all, it's not about you having to struggle with the same issue for 20 years. It's about God freeing you so you can talk about next 20 years what he did 20 years ago for you. Okay. Watch this. The... The Ammonites crossed the Jordan to fight against Judah. Benjamin and Ephraim and Israel was in great distress. They're taking more property that belonged to Israel over and over again. And then, now, we're, we're, we're the sin, we're the suffering. Now we're coming into the salvation piece, then, or supplication piece. Then the, then the Israelites cried out to the Lord, who we've sinned against you, forsaking our God and serving the Baals. Look at the next verse. The Lord said, this is God talking, when the Egyptians, the Ammonites, the Amorites, the Ammonites, the Philistines, the Sidonians, and the Amalekites, and the Mainites oppressed you, and you cried to me for help, did I not save you from their hands? Now notice God's response here. But you have forsaken me and served other gods, so I will no longer save you. Whoa. 
Go and cry out to the gods you've chosen. Let them save you when you're in trouble. This almost sounds like God is done with them. I mean, how many of you have ever, have ever looked at somebody and said, hey, you want to make dumb decisions? Too bad, so sad. Let's be honest about it. You want to do that? Fine. I'm done with you. But, but, but then you've got to read it in context. Because it almost sounds like God is, is whipping them when they're down. But in actuality, God is trying to get them to a place of response. And notice this. But the Israelites said to the Lord, we're not making any more excuses. Look at somebody and say, no more excuses. We've sinned. Do with us whatever you think best, but rescue us now. And they got rid of the foreign gods among them and served the Lord. And this is the one phrase that God grabbed me with. And God himself could no longer bear their misery. God is now suffering with his people. He's feeling the pain he has touched. Hebrews said, with the feelings of our infirmities. For he was wounded for our transgression. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And by his stripes we are healed. God, God begins to, to feel what is going on here. He's mourning what is going on with the people. I need you to understand something today. That God is feeling the issue more than you are. You say, I, I don't know if God understands where I'm at or not. I don't know if God knows what's going on with me or not. I want you to understand that God can no longer bear your issue. It is weighing now on him. So what is God going to do? He's just going to show up in the middle of the night and suddenly you're going to get free from everything. If you'll turn the page from Judges chapter 10 to Judges chapter 11, you begin to see how God moves us out of this oppressive state and, and Judges, the next chapter, will say this, now Jephthah, say this, now Jephthah. Was a great warrior from the land of Gilead, okay? But his mother was a prostitute. His father, whose name was Gilead, had several other sons by his legitimate wife. And when these half-brothers grew up, they chased Jephthah out of the country. They didn't want him. And know what they said to him? And can't the, can't the Bible just be a little softer on this? <laughs> no. What it says, you son of a whore. I want to ask you a question. How many of you have ever had stinging words? spoken to you about your issues by another person or family member. They're, they're, not, they're not trying to be soft here. Oh, I know dad had a little problem. I know he had a little issue, and I know you were kind of born because of this. We'd rather not have you around. Oh, no, 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 no. There, there, there's, there's no softness in the communication going on here. You son of a whore, we don't want you around. And it stings. And their primary goal is that <laughs> Jephthah doesn't get the inheritance. We're not sharing any money with you. Oh, isn't it interesting how it all comes down to that? So Jephthah exits, just goes. Let me say it to you again. Are there any Words that have stung you over the years that are still stinging. So watch this. So Jephthah fled from his father's home and lived in the land of Tob. <laughs> Where's Tob? Well, you can look it up on a map, but it's where his family is not. Soon... He had quite a band of rebels, malcontents, 
as his followers. Let's not be too hard on that because there were other people that had been stung and birds of a feather always stick together. So those that have been stung grow together to sting other people. And living off the land is what? It was about this time. Now about this time, the Ammonites began their war against Israel and the leaders of Gilead sent for, What now? They sent for who? Somebody qualified. Somebody who could do it. No, they sent for... You can't find anybody else but the son of a whore? Isn't that what you called him? Isn't that what you said he was? Begging him. Look at the text. Begging him to come and lead their army against the Ammonites. I want you to understand in 2023, and this is where I want us to get this, because we have made Jesus a political messiah to save us from our political issues. He is not a political Messiah. He came to seek and to save those who were lost, not rescue us from politicians. And I want you to understand this. Don't miss, don't miss this. It's always been this way, and it's going to be this way in 2023. God doesn't look for a method. He looks for a man, a woman, a teenager, a boy, and a girl to do his work. God isn't looking for a strategy. He's looking for you. He's looking for me. And so, so, so look at this again. They ask for Jephthah to come. Okay, let me give this to you in five minutes. That's faith talking there. How are the unqualified? How are you going to make a difference in this coming year? Because honestly, a lot of us just come to church and do our thing, and we never think to Monday morning that maybe God might have a purpose beyond Sunday for us. Number one, watch this, the unqualified forgive. So Jephthah accepted, what? Accepted the commission and was made commander in chief and king. The contract was ratified before the Lord at Mizpah at a general assembly of all the people. You mean he went back to those people that had called him a son of a whore? He went back to the people that gave him stinging words. He went to the individuals that had threw him out. Okay, watch this. Write this down. Write this down. God's purpose must become more important than my personal pain. You want to know why God can't use some of us? Because we're still wound up in what happened. We're still wound up in what they said. We're still wound up in what they did. God's purpose must become more important than my personal pain. See, the unqualified forgive. Here, here, here's the second thing. The unqualified have a secret weapon. There's only four times in the book of Judges when the phrase is used, the Spirit of the Lord came upon Othniel, Samson, Gideon, and Jephthah. You see, I'm not qualified because I know something. I'm qualified because I know someone. I get, and let's just be honest about it, I get that there are people that revel where well, I have more biblical knowledge of that particular subject than you do. Nanny, 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 nanny. <laughs> you ever want to stick your tongue out at people before? <laughs> It wasn't, if you do read the text, he had a deep knowledge of Israel's history, but that wasn't enough. 
Your Bible and religious understanding, my theological education is not enough. Then the Spirit of the Lord came upon Jephthah, and he led his army across the land of Gilead and Manasseh, past Mizpah and Gilead, and attacked the army of Ammon. Write this down. Without him, I can do nothing. But with him, I can do all things. Okay. Okay. Look at somebody and say, without him, I can do nothing. But with him, I can do all things. Ash, come to the keys real quick. It makes people feel better. <laughs> okay, here, here's the third thing I want you to understand. The unqualified must learn the difference between zeal and knowledge. Now, now watch the text. Don't miss this. He hears from God, the Holy Spirit comes on him, and there's going to be a great victory. Meanwhile, Jephthah had vowed to the Lord that if God would help Israel conquer the Ammonites, then when he returned home in peace, the first person coming out of his house to meet him would be sacrificed as a burnt offering to the Lord. What? That makes no sense. He's feeling so much zeal with anointing. He's seeing God's purpose. He understands that there's going to be a victory here because the Spirit of God is touching him. So he opens up the mouth, his mouth and says a dumb thing. <laughs> now, scholars are at a differences of opinion because when he gets home, his daughter runs. The first thing that runs out of his house is his daughter. Scholars are at differences of opinion whether or not this man he actually sacrificed or is a burnt offering. I tend to lean into no because it violates everything about the law of God. Others feel that she was commanded to be a virgin and not get married the rest of her life. That was a big deal if you were commanded for a young girl never to be married. That's not part of the story, however... Here's what the unqualified need to be careful. Don't let your tongue get you into trouble. Look at somebody and say, don't let your tongue get you into trouble. Write it down. Because in the middle of God doing something, don't let your tongue get you into trouble. Okay. Now some of you, it's raining out there. It's indicative of what is going to happen in this region when the Holy Spirit shows up. I'm not trying to spiritualize it. I'm just trying to give you some reality here. That's what we're after. We're not after more of somebody's religion and their Sunday morning church that makes them feel so spiritual. We're after something that floods our religion and overwhelms everything that we know about God. Okay. It's the end of August, I believe, in the mid-90s. I think it was August 31st. The news reports. You couldn't turn. You couldn't turn on the news. You couldn't read anything that didn't talk about the death of Princess Diana. And then the conspiracy theories start, which I'm starting to learn something. A lot of stuff that we thought was conspiracy might be true. <laughs> day after day, hour after hour, they talked about Princess Diana. Five days later, this got very little coverage. Very little. Five days later, Mother Teresa passes away. Mother Teresa had five, only five, worn dresses in her closet. That was it. I'm not trying to diminish the contribution that Princess Diana may have made to our culture. But is it not interesting that the talented and the wealthy and the gifted get all of the news. And the woman who said, I'm a little pencil, 
Just a little pencil. In the hand of a writing God who is sending a love letter to the world. How all of the attention is on her and very little attention is on her. And yet, I'm not making a judgment here. Please, please don't misunderstand me. But in the kingdom of God, it's reversed. It may be, and I don't know, because we're not there yet. But the Bible does say, the first will be last, and the last will be first. The unqualified always take over the qualified. And here's what I believe the Lord wants me to say to you this morning and stand with me right now. That sitting in this room today are individuals who have compared yourself to other people and you have said, you know, let them do that. They're, that's their deal. It's, they're far more, they got more going for them than I do. Or maybe you have said, you know, that's somebody else's responsibility. That's just not mine. Let, let the politicians do it. Let the preachers do it. Let the pastors do it. I got, I got my responsibility over here to just do my life. Can I tell you that in 2023, and it may begin before that for some of you, God's going to put some things in your mind. God's going to put some things in your heart. And you're going to say, I don't know, God. Somebody else is far more qualified than me to do that. And that cannot be God talking. And I'm telling you, it is. Because 2023 is going to be the year of the unqualified. Altar team, won't you come to the altar right now quickly? And how many of you, and spread out please, how many of you are willing in this coming year, how many of you are willing in this coming year, let me repeat the question, how many of you are willing in this coming year? I'm not asking you to respond because you're supposed to. It actually does concern me that there are people that have attended this church for years and haven't been one time to this altar, but that's a different message. How many of you in the room would say to yourself, you know what? Our country desperately needs not a method but a man or a woman. And how many of you in this room might be able to say God if you're looking this way I'm available. How many feel like that? Anybody feel like that? Come right now. And I want you to listen to me. You're bringing yourself as an offering. I know that maybe you have many needs. Physical, emotional, spiritual, financial. There is a time to pray for those things. But right now is not the time. Right now, you are offering yourself as the unqualified to make a difference in a home, in a city, in a region, in the nation, in the world. Let me give some instruction here. Altar team, if you spend 10 minutes with somebody, somebody will get missed. So it is not the length of time that we pray over one another today. It is the quality of time. So I want you to move in close. I want everybody in the room to lift your hands toward the Lord. If, 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 you, if you have to go, 
we're so grateful that you're here today and thank you for being in God's house. But 2023 is going to be the year when God does some things in, in your lives that are standing in this room right now that have never been done before because God is going to take the Holy Spirit and make you qualified, not because of who you are, but because of who he is. Let's pray right now. Let's pray. Let's pray and move up as close as you can. Pray over one person team and then move to the next person, then move to the next person. I want everybody up here today to make sure that somebody has laid hands on them today. We bless the name of the Lord. Now fill this room with an atmosphere of worship and praise today. Come on. Thank you, Jesus.